We're going to have an update on, on uh, the U.S.-Canada tax treaty and uh, uh, transfer pricing issues uh, with our two speakers today. Um, Jeffrey Schaefer's with Blake Castles in Toronto. He's an associate there, former mechanical engineer who has become a tax lawyer. And uh, I'll let you read his bio in uh, the papers. He's won many awards. Um, formerly uh, got his undergraduate degree at the University of Waterloo. Miller Williams of Ernst & Young uh, from Georgia. Expert in transfer pricing issues and, and uh, advanced pricing agreements. Uh, and he will address uh, those issues as well. And I'm just as as uh, as a uh, regular citizen in the world of advanced uh, pricing agreements, my understanding, Miller, maybe you can correct me, is that it's always tempting if I can get a better tax rate in in Canada than I can in the U.S. to try to move my taxable income to somewhere else. But sometimes the IRS comes in and sort of reallocates that income under Section 482, and I'd be pretty unhappy if I hadn't planned for that and suddenly have the reallocation. So there's this arrangement where you go into the IRS and get an advanced pricing agreement so that if you do things the way you say you're going to do them, the IRS won't reallocate on you. But that only works if you can involve the Canadian tax authorities so you don't end up paying double tax. Some, something like that? Right, that's uh, what we'll talk a little bit about. Okay, well why don't we begin um, with Miller Williams and he can talk about these uh, advanced pricing agreements. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you about uh, transfer pricing, specifically as it relates to the U.S.-Canada uh, Income Tax Treaty and advanced pricing agreements and competent authority, and also the arbitration provisions of, of the treaty that uh, have recently come into play. Uh, before I start, I'll just kind of give you some basic disclaimers here uh, from Ernst & Young, which I'm required to do. And in terms of today's uh, agenda, uh, let me just give a little, maybe a basic background on transfer pricing. Some of you may know more about it than others. But transfer pricing is how uh, companies transfer goods, services, and intellectual property among their related or affiliated groups uh, of companies around the world. And it's very important in that based on this pricing, if you have a significant amount of intercompany transactions for a particular legal entity or or consolidated group of taxpayers in a country, that that will lead to what is the profit for that company, which in turn will determine what your taxable income is. And so from a tax authority standpoint, it's extremely important as to what this pricing is because it will ultimately determine 
the amount of tax that's paid. Transfer pricing, based on a number of surveys done by Ernst & Young and, and, and other firms out there, when we talk with our clients, what we find is that transfer pricing is really their top international tax uh, concern for, for a large multinational company that has a lot of, a lot of transactions. And uh, it's a very subjective area. There's not really a, uh, a black or white answer. Uh, we, in the transfer pricing field, it's a combination of lawyers, economists, uh, working together in these projects you know, and business people. And we try to make it as scientific or quantitative as possible, but in reality, it's very subjective and it's based on the facts and circumstances. Uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into the transfer pricing and that you want to be able to, in advance to set uh, what the functions and the risk are of a legal entity uh, in order to assist in analyzing the transfer pricing and proving it out ultimately. Uh, it is based on the arm's length standard. It's how, what two parties would negotiate in terms of the transfer price. Uh, that being different that you may be familiar with here in the U.S. among the states, uh, some of them have an arm's length principle, but most have an apportionment principle where they look at the profits of the U.S. company and then divide those total profits into each state based on things such as sales or assets or wages that are in that particular state to carve out what should be the taxable income in the state. That is different from this arm's length principle. The arm's length principle has been uh, in the international um, area by you know, the Department of Treasury and, and the foreign governments around the world and the OECD uh, transfer pricing guidelines have all affirmed the arm's length standard as opposed to the apportionment standard. And generally most of the countries follow this other, with the one exception of Brazil that has, has really set certain transfer pricing rules based on, on returns versus actual arm's length uh, principles. To give you just a few examples, and, and then I'll start in, in terms of what today's agenda is, uh, let's say we have a U.S. company that makes widgets, and they set up a distributor in Canada, and then they sell the widgets up to Canada, and this distributor sells it on to customers. If that price that the U.S. sells over is at a very high price uh, and the price that it's sold at plus all the selling costs in Canada and maybe startup costs to get this going are greater than what they can sell it for, that company will end up with a loss. And so in that example, it's really which company should bear that startup cost and some of this, uh, you know, in terms of setting the price, should the U.S. sell it at a lower price and then Canada will be able to on-sell it and make a profit. Uh, and, and that's really what we're talking about in terms of the pricing. And it could be just the opposite of that. A Canadian company making a product, selling it down to a U.S. distributor. It could be a situation of intellectual property, whether it's a, a patent or know-how or copyright uh, trademark being charged up to the Canadian company that may manufacture something. Or think of uh, retailers. If you have a U.S.-based retailer uh, that has set up stores and then goes up to Canada and begins to set up stores, what should be the charge that they, they charge for the use of the name? Or it could be what, what sometimes you don't think about. It's something may not be just for the name. It may be the system of how to operate. It may be relationships with vendors. Uh, so all of these come into play. It, it may be services that the U.S. company renders for the benefit of, this Canadian, of the Canadian operations. So all of those things come into uh, transfer pricing. Uh, another area that it can come up in, what if you have two plants that are making product, and uh, one in Canada, one in the US, and you decide, uh, if it was a US parent company, they decide to close the Canadian company, who should bear all the restructuring costs uh, related to it. So these are a number of the issues that we deal with. And, and as you can see, both parties uh, from the Canadian side and from the IRS side um, have these transfer pricing rules in place. We have penalty provisions in place in both countries. Canada's are actually more, in a sense, severe than the U.S. 
because the penalty is on the the ten percent penalty in Canada is on the amount of the adjustment, whereas in the U.S. the penalty is on the amount of additional tax paid. So the penalty provisions that, that come into play. Uh, we also now have FIN 48 provisions for companies in terms of assessing their, their taxes, uh, that they want the certainty around the transfer pricing. Uh, some of you may have heard recently about, and, and actually one of the handouts that I provided uh, relates to this as, as from a Canada perspective, but also just gives some basic explanation. Uh, the U.S., the IRS has issued uh, uh, 2010-9 where they're asking for disclosure on the tax returns going forward of all these uncertain tax positions and the FIN 48 positions of companies. So we're going to see, I, I think, a lot more controversy around this because of those provisions. One of the, the ways to minimize transfer pricing issues is through the use of a bilateral advanced pricing agreement. And we're going to talk about that in detail, and I'll try to really specifically relate it to uh, the U.S. and Canada. Uh, steps to successfully negotiate an APA, uh, and what also then ties to the APA are the competent authority of provisions or mutual agreement procedures that we have in income tax treaties around the world, uh, specifically also the for Canada and the U.S., and these provisions are designed to present prevent double taxation. Uh, and, and from a transfer pricing standpoint, that is, that's, that's a, in, in one sense, that can be considered success. And that when we have these transfer pricing issues, that you only pay tax in one jurisdiction uh, on, on the, the profits. Now certainly, the I guess maybe the ultimate success is when you're actually able to through your transfer pricing and your functions and risk and your alignment, be able to put uh, the profit into a low tax jurisdiction. But when you're dealing between two high tax countries like Canada and the U.S., and, and potentially Canada you know, has a little bit lower tax rate, but it really depends on each company situations. They could have losses in the U.S., they could have financing arrangements in Canada, all different factors that come into play. Foreign, use of foreign tax credits. So in, in terms of U.S. and Canada, many times you're, you're trying to work it out so that you do not have double tax. Uh, sometimes you have other uh, countries that do come into play, like a low tax jurisdiction. So for example, U.S. could be licensing know-how to, to a related party in Ireland, and then the party in Ireland sells product into Canada, and maybe Canada makes an adjustment on the transfer pricing and how do you deal with that between, say, multiple countries. Then, in, in, in terms of the competent authority, one of the issues that has come up over the years of competent authority is how do we really force the two governments to come together and reach an agreement? They each have, they want to each put more taxable income into their two locations. Uh, and what, what has been, uh, has come up with is we call the arbitration provisions. The U.S. has this only in a couple treaties, I think Germany, Belgium, and, and Canada. In the e EU, they have something very similar to this, and basically we'll talk about these arbitration provisions, but they, they really, the idea is that if a case cannot be settled in a reasonable amount of time, that it will be pushed into the arbitration procedure so it will be settled. And then, of course, ultimately the idea is that, that you never get to the arbitration procedure. In terms of uh, just developing once once transfer pricing, it's it's really a, a life cycle of planning in, in, in terms of the transfer pricing, uh, analysis, uh, compliance, and then documentation. And when we talk about documentation, what we mean there is uh, the actual transfer pricing studies and how it's presented on the tax returns. Both countries have. Uh, forms. Canada has what's called a T106. The U.S. has forms 5472 or 5471. And on these forms specifically, you have to list out the related party transactions. Uh, on the Canada one specifically, 
they ask for, uh, do you have documentation in place at the time of filing this tax return? And, and so that is a, a you know an important area. And, and also you have to throughout this process check to make sure what's what uh, is your policy is being followed. Uh, and at the end of the year, you may have to make what we call a compensating adjustment to actually adjust the transfer pricing to bring it in line. Uh, one of the problems with making the adjustments uh, is actually probably will be mentioned in the, in the next section after this related to customs. Because now, uh, transfer pricing is working with this arm's length principle. Customs is actually working with something similar but different. And uh, in terms of transaction value, and so companies have transferred goods, put a specific price on a customs form uh, going in or out of the U.S. or in and out of Canada, and under U.S. transfer pricing rules, and I believe also something probably similar to Canada, it's important that those match up in some way. Where there's a provision called Section 1059A. While it recognizes there are differences between the value for transfer pricing and customs, it still uh, is important that this, this match up or you can run into uh, you know, customs valuation issues. All right, moving into uh, advanced pricing agreements. Uh, in, back in the, in the probably late, in, in the 1980s, transfer pricing became more of an issue with the IRS, first with pharmaceutical companies, and then with inbound companies to the U.S. Uh, and what we saw is that these cases became very, and the audits became very controversial. Uh, in some cases, uh, situations where it's very personal, where the auditor has a particular position, the company has a particular position. Um, when I worked for the IRS in the early 90s, and, and this program was just started, and I was fortunate enough to be at the IRS and, and work in that program, uh, I mean, I went to meetings where I was sitting at the end of the table and I had, you know, five or six IRS people on this side and people from the company and representatives and it was, you know, you really had to work to, to you know, listen to both sides and try to bring them together uh, and, and minimize the, the controversy and, and the ill will that, that was in the room. Uh, and so this program uh, it's just, it started in the early 90s and has been very successful uh, for the IRS and for taxpayers as a way to come together to resolve transfer pricing. And in the bilateral context that we're going to talk about, it's, it's been very much a success. Uh, so we have what we call unilateral APAs, and both Canada and the IRS will issue unilaterals. And then we also have bilaterals or multilateral where the company, co companies and the countries come together and resolve this through the competent authority grant um, provisions. The APA is a contract between, actually between the IRS and the U.S. taxpayer. Same with if there's a bilateral APA, eventually there is a contract between the CRA and the Canadian company. Uh, it sets out what are the agreement on the facts, uh, the transfer pricing methodology. And when we talk about transfer pricing methodology, under the transfer pricing rules, uh, we have certain methods that apply to tangible property and intangible property and services. Uh, some of these methods would be a comparable and controlled price, we call it COP. Uh, we have what's called the resale price, which looks at gross margins for distributors. Uh, we have cost plus, it looks like typically cost plus for manufacturers. Uh, we have one of the methods that based on the IRS reports for transfer pricing about the APA program uh, is the comparable profits method, or you may also hear the word transactional net margin method, which is the, the OCD version. It's really just the comparable profits method done correctly, as I would say. Uh, but the, and then we have what's called profit split methods, whereby essentially you're determining what the routine returns are for activities, looking at your excess profit, and agreeing to split that or share that in some way. And many times in a bilateral APA or in a 
competent authority matter, this, this profit split comes into play, where each side is trying to understand what is the, the residual or excess profit in the system to figure out which part should be in their country and, and why. Uh, it then agrees on an arm's length range of results. The, uh, it, it sets out the, it's based on the arm's length standard. It's a typically for five years, can be slightly longer, and then it can be renewed. Uh, it can be rolled back. And what we mean by rolled back is that if you were to reach it, if an, an advanced pricing agreement is for tax years going forward. So it's based on um, where you have not actually filed a return. So if we had a taxpayer that has a calendar year of 2009, in order, we could cover 2009, assuming they haven't filed their 2009 tax return, up until, you know, in Canada, June 30th, we could bring it in, or for U.S. purposes, September 15th, let's say, when they filed their return. Um, we could cover that year, but we couldn't cover, say, 08 and before, because those years are already filed. But assuming the facts and, and circumstances are similar in the APA years, you're able to roll back the same agreement to those years through competent authority and, and, and secret resolution. So what you could have is a client that maybe has an audit going on for 05, 06, 07, something like this. You then file for an advanced pricing agreement uh, to cover going forward, and then you roll it back to cover this audit and, and what I would call the in-between years, years that are not under audit, but years that are not in the APA. Uh, Critical assumptions are put into this actual contract between the, the taxpayer and, and the IRS and, and, and with Canada in order to give you an out. Uh, if there was a substantial change in the business or the, or the circumstances, or for example, what we just faced with a major downturn in the economy, uh, companies that had built in the right critical assumptions were able to go back in and potentially renegotiate. Uh, the, the, revenue, the IRS revenue procedure that, that covers this is actually, uh, it should be 2006-9. Uh, I think my uh, proofreaders did too good a job of, of making changes here, but that should be 2006-9 is the IRS revenue procedure that covers APAs. And it's, Canada has similar, a, a circular that uh, goes through the APA. I'm just going to talk through the APA process a little bit. Uh, these are the phases, and this applies really to Canada and the U.S., unilateral or, you know, in a sense, bilateral. Uh, we have the, the analysis phase, the pre-filing conference, uh, the APA request, the negotiation, uh, and then the drafting and administration, meaning there are annual reports that uh, you file after each uh, year. This is a nice chart that goes through the whole process of the data gathering to start out of, of understanding what the facts and circumstances are, economic analysis going out and finding comparables and doing analysis on what should be the pricing, looking at what your strategy is going to be in the APA negotiations, uh, whether it's more of a technical argument, whether it's facts and circumstances based, whether you're relying on internal comparables or external comparables, uh, adjustments that might be made, uh, to those, and, and just, you know, what do you want to do in terms of if you have losses in Canada, are you trying to put income there, or if you have losses in the U.S., you're trying to put income there, all of those things to, to keep in mind. Then you prepare a pre-filing document. You actually go into the IRS or the CRA for this pre-filing conference. And the pre-filing conference was originally designed going well, way back because companies weren't sure what this program was really about. And it gave them an opportunity to come in and talk to the IRS about the program, how it worked, and, and some feedback based on how much information is provided uh, to, to what would be the ultimate outcome of this. And, and because uh, at the beginning, again, it was for companies to learn about it, there's a provision that allows for anonymous APA pre-filing and a known pre-filing. In an anonymous uh, pre-filing conference, uh, the taxpayer's name is not revealed to the IRS. They come in, they meet with the taxing authority, uh, and in some cases they may not reveal 
information, that much detail about the company or who they really are. Uh, as I always say, we don't make people actually wear like a little bag over their head and you know cut the eyes out. But uh, it is it is anonymous, and they come in and uh, discuss the case. The the primary difference is if it's a known taxpayer, the IRS will notify the local IRS field office about. Uh, the taxpayer, and then they can actually participate in the conference. So if you had an audit going on that wasn't going well, you wouldn't necessarily want to have a uh, known pre-filing conference because then, then the field is going to show up at the meeting. Or you may want the field to show up because that's part of your strategy of trying to work with the field to try to resolve this. Uh, once you determine that, and, and in the case of the bilateral APA, typically there's a pre-filing meeting with Canada, pre-filing meeting with the IRS to understand their positions. Uh, and, and it also allows you feedback into what should go into your, your ultimate submission. We then have the, uh, I guess I actually have slides on each one of these, so let me flip down to uh, next. Then we have the APA request. I talked a little bit about the timing. Uh, in terms of on the U.S. side, you could actually file by September 15th to cover 2009, and then you have another 120 days to file the actual submission itself. So you, you sort of have a lot of extra time there of actually filing, say, next January to cover 2009. Uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the request, it's... it's Similar to a transfer pricing study, it lays out all the facts and circumstances, economic analysis, it sets out the position, uh, but then there's some other additional information that's provided. The overall APA is designed to be a cooperative process between the IRS and the taxpayer. So at the pre-filing, the IRS may have, or, or CRA may have said, we're looking for this type of information, and so you will specifically try to address that in your, your actual request. The documents that you present to the IRS and to CRA in the case of a bilateral APA are typically the same documents. Whatever information is being provided to one tax authority is being provided to the other tax authority. And what you find out in terms of your strategy is that you're trying to understand where the IRS is coming from and where the uh, CRA is coming from. And, and then you have to really try to bring the two governments together. And that process starts you know, at the pre-filing and in this, this request. And this is just a very simple example. But if I had a royalty that I was going to charge from the U.S. up to a Canadian company, and the IRS did some analysis, and they felt the royalty rate should be 6 or 7%, and Canada did some analysis and thought that the royalty rate should be 1%, then in order to prevent double taxation, what I've got to do is work with the client and the uh, information and facts and circumstances and, and most likely try to bring the two governments together to, to a number of like 3 or 4% or somewhere in that range. Uh, versus trying to say, oh, the IRS is completely right, it should be 7%, your, your chance of getting that pushed through with CRA uh, would not be very good. Likewise, if you're trying to take CRA's position of 7% and push that with the IRS, you're also most likely not going to be that successful. Once you file the, the request, you then move into the uh, uh, negotiation Procedures and, and at that point you start to negotiate with the governments. Uh, there's can be divided into working groups like the Economist. Uh, the, the the IRS will, will send uh, information requests and respond to those. Again, if the IRS issues information requests and you respond, you also provide the same information to Canada. Uh, also at this time, the Canadian side tends to do more site visits, and so. They would come, say, to the, if there were a facility in Canada, they would come there maybe and do interviews with people, and they would also come to the U.S. and potentially do interviews with uh, people. And if there was some kind of site visit to see the plan or facility, 
they would do that also. Uh, and then as, as the negotiations take place, on the IRS side, we have the advanced pricing agreement team that's been formed. There's a leader from the APA program, team leader, and then there's team members that are made up of people from competent authority and from the field and economists within the APA program. And, and the, this team then formulates a negotiating position and submits that to competent authority, which then competent authority will then go to Canada and negotiate. The Advanced Pricing Agreement Office is under Chief Counsel's Office for the IRS, where the lawyers are under Chief Counsel and Associate Chief Counsel or National. And then the Tax Treaty Division that handles the, the competent authority is under the IRS uh, LSMB uh, area for a large mid-sized case in the international area. So you have uh, the, the position papers formed, it then goes to competent authority, and then the two governments come together. On the Canadian side, the, the APA and the competent authority are really, you know, one group. Once you, you reach settlement, you then uh, enter into a national agreement. Some of the strategies, uh, we try to have smaller APA teams, but at the same time, we necessarily can't prevent the IRS from adding people to their team. Uh, we like to get more taxpayers. The IRS or the CRA wants to hear from the taxpayer what the facts are, the business issues. Uh, certainly we try to standardize some of the filings in order to, to, to minimize fees. Uh, and then we keep following up with the government. Uh, one of the issues right now is that it's taking a long time to complete APAs uh, because the government has uh, a lack of resources. Uh, the U.S., for example, has uh, several hundred APAs pending. They had 127 filed. Uh, there, there was just a recent report issue. Uh, and the time frame to complete a bilateral was something like 45 months. Uh, that's also in one of the handouts that I provided is a, an Ernst & Young analysis of this uh, recent report. The report was ordered by Congress a few years ago in lieu of the, the various sort of the, the tax publications asking for actual publication of the APAs, and that was upheld to be taxpayer information or the settlement was, was given whereby the, this annual report would come out. So it contains a lot of information about the APA program from the U.S. side. And Canada issues a, uh, a similar report. They, they have something like an inventory of about 85 cases with 35 of uh, new cases that have been filed in the last year. And typically, they had only had about 20 cases being filed every year. So that has really uh, grown. These are some of the, the, the items that uh, to come into play. Just maybe in, in based on sort of the time frame this morning, uh, I think where you have you know high, two high tax jurisdictions, where you have a treaty with the US or with Canada can work. Uh, if you don't have income tax treaty, you cannot do a bilateral APA. Uh, and, and certainly if uh, you know, we have issues in the back years and in the current years that are the same, you can really resolve a number of issues. Uh, in terms of cost, the APA is, it, it can be expensive to go through, but if you're settling up 10 years of transfer pricing versus you had to do a transfer pricing study every single year, uh, it, it can work out to be a fairly reasonable amount uh, when you start putting it on a per year basis and you have multiple you know, millions of dollars of, of transfers going on. Canada is, is definitely one of the jurisdictions. Many, many practitioners and companies would say it's probably one of the, the, the country that has the greatest enforcement of transfer pricing, very you know, detailed analysis of it. Uh, I've seen audits where right from the beginning the, the Canadian tax authority just denied all service charges and the company, U.S. company had to try to go back and prove those up. So with that happening and, and with the IRS also auditing inbound companies, we've had a lot of controversy. And for maybe smaller companies or issues that aren't going to be ongoing, the competent authority process is a good one. Uh, it's under the income tax treaty. The two governments uh, take you, you file the competent authority request, and the two governments then come together to negotiate the, uh, the 
the resolution of the case. Their goal being to resolve and, and not have double taxation. So they may in, not end up with the exact way that you might want it to come out, but there's a good chance that it will, the, the statistics say something like 90 or 95% of the time it works out that there would not be any amount that's subject to double taxation. These are some of the things that go into the, the request. Uh, it's, it's set out in, for the IRS in Revenue Procedure 2006-54, and Canada has something uh, very similar to this. So you, the, the success rate is high. The cost is it's really somewhat minimal. Uh, there's no fee to actually file, whereas the APA, there's a fee of 50000 in the U.S., and for smaller ones, 22000 On the Canada side, it's 5000 for small ones, and something in the neighborhood of 25000 for travel expenses on the, on the other side. In, we also have something in the U.S. where you can go into appeals after you've had the audit, and then appeals kind of puts the case on hold and works with competent authority to resolve the, uh, the case. The, the final provision, just take a, a moment here to talk about this, is uh, I mentioned earlier about the arbitration uh, provision. So this was added to the U.S.-Canada Treaty uh, just a couple years ago. This is the actual provisions. The two governments, as of, and, and just recently, uh, the, the person who's the quote, competent authority is a woman, uh, Patricia Spice, who's uh, head of this for Canada. And just recently, a, 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 a gentleman, Mike Danilak, was named as the U.S. side. And Mike Boyback is actually associate uh, chief counsel international, and I work for the IRS. But he, he's now on the IRS side in terms of uh, the, the competent authority. And in, in terms of, they, they have not, the IRS and CRA have not come together to, to set out specifically how this provision will work. What both have said is we hope that we never have to use the provision. And so it's coming up where, where this has now been in place. Uh, and the two-year mark will be, uh, I think, December 15th of this year. So there could be cases at that point that have not been settled by December 15th where this provision could come into play. And it's still unclear whether it was going to be allowed for cases that have been filed in the past versus cases going forward. We'll appreciate your time, and I think uh, turn it over to Jeff, and then we'll probably take maybe a few minutes at the end for questions. And I'll also be around right after this. I'll be happy to, to answer any questions. Thanks. And so, as Miller mentioned, 
the objective is always, uh, in general, to minimize tax, but at least to, to eliminate double tax so that you're not paying tax on the same item of income in more than one jurisdiction. To accomplish this, countries negotiate bilateral tax treaties and allocate among them the jurisdiction to tax certain items of profit or income in various circumstances. Uh, both Canada and the U.S. have very broad ranging networks of treaties uh, with countries around the world. The Canada-U.S. tax treaty, at least from the Canadian perspective, is a little bit special. It has some unique provisions in it that are there, I think, primarily in recognition of just our unique relationship from the Canadian perspective with the U.S. and the volume of business activity that crosses that border. Um, the first point here, uh, the U.S. generally develops a technical explanation to explain sort of the IRS's or, or the negotiator's <coughs> position on the intended meaning behind a treaty. In the case of the Canada-U.S. tax treaty, the Canadian government participated to a limited extent in the development of that technical explanation and then formally announced its approval, which is actually a very helpful uh, step for people like me because it, it permits us to have re in Canada uh, to have recourse to the technical explanation in terms of explaining the provisions of the treaty. The Canada-U.S. Treaty was last amended uh, by the Fifth Protocol. The Fifth Protocol was announced in September of 2007. It only came into effect uh, in December of 2008, and certain of its provisions have been phased in over time, with some of the most significant provisions only coming into force uh, as recently as January 1, 2010. Uh, as these provisions come into force, the market practice is evolving because some of these provisions are quite unique and as practitioners and the governments alike are forced to grapple with these new provisions, we're all sort of discovering issues and technicalities, glitches if you will, uh, that might not have been apparent uh, upon first review and we're all having to sort of cope with these, with these uh, developments. The, the changes to Canadian tax law, as I, develop, as I mentioned um, in our budget, on the broadest possible level, the changes that, that were announced uh, will affect uh, the degree to which Canada taxes gains uh, in the hands of non-residents on the disposition of certain Canadian property, and it will go, uh, the change will go a fair ways to simplifying the compliance burden on non-residents um, even if it doesn't have a tremendous effect on the ultimate tax liability, which would likely have been in a very similar position if the non-resident was covered by a, by a tax treaty with Canada. Those are some of the specific items I'm hoping to cover. Uh, Miller adequately covered the, uh, the mandatory arbitration provision in the treaty, so I don't propose to spend any additional time on that. Uh, I guess I should say that um, uh, we'll try not to get uh, into too technical a level uh, on these provisions. The context that uh, I'm sort of hoping to discuss these in is that the Canada-U.S. tax treaty uh, is an interesting example of the governments coming together to try and map out that border between their two regimes which would otherwise overlap and, and subject uh, residents of each country to double taxation. The treaty, uh, as we're discovering with some of these new provisions, is also a cautionary tale, or at least a good opportunity for a lesson in the difficulty in establishing that kind of border between two regimes where that not only have different rules, but in certain cases have different fundamental vocabulary. So that's one of the issues that we're having to deal with now as we, uh, as we seek to implement and apply some of these new provisions. Uh, one of the one of the very welcome changes uh, in the in the new treaty, excuse me, uh, in the new treaty was the elimination of withholding tax on interest uh, as a result or in anticipation of the release of the U.S. treaty. Canada actually amended its domestic tax law to eliminate withholding tax on so-called arms length or most arms length interest as of January 1, 2008. Um, just for the U.S. people, when I say arm's length, I mean it in the Canadian, uh, in the in the Canadian context, which is to say, uh, the relationship between the parties is arm's length, uh, rather than referring to the terms and conditions of the, the debt and the interest. Um, 
one of the special features of the new Canada-US treaty, which is unique in the Canadian context, is the elimination of withholding tax on related party interest uh, to qualifying US residents. That elimination was phased in. Um, the way it was drafted, related party interest or all interest payments prior to the amendment of the treaty would have been subject to a 10% withholding tax rate. That was phased down to 7% uh, in 2008, 4% in 2009, and 0% uh, starting in 2010, assuming uh, one meets the requirements. Uh, the last point is uh, just a uh, cautionary one. There is still withholding tax on certain kinds of participating interest, so it's not, uh, not completely out of the picture. The next, the next innovation, if you will, uh, in the new treaty are the provisions dealing with so-called fiscally transparent entities, uh, the best and most prominent example of which uh, are U.S. LLCs, limited liability companies. The issue is that most limited liability companies, uh, which are either disregarded or treated as partnerships for U.S. tax law, have traditionally not been considered to be resident of uh, resident in the United States for purposes of the treaty by the Canadian tax authorities. The reason for this is that residence requires that a person be subject to tax in that jurisdiction effectively on the most comprehensive uh, available basis. And the position of the Canadian tax authorities has always been that a disregarded LLC or one taxed as a partnership uh, is not subject to tax itself at all. All of its income is taxed in the hands of its members. However, because the LLC has a separate legal identity and is regarded as a corporation for Canadian purposes, uh, it is still the visible taxpayer of the Canadian system. And by virtue of not paying tax itself, the Canadian government has taken the position that it was not a resident of the U.S. for purposes of the treaty, and therefore not entitled to the benefits of the treaty, uh, including reduced withholding tax rates on certain kinds of payments. Uh, interestingly, within the last couple of days, uh, the first case ever in the Tax Court of Canada dealing with this issue came out. It was released on Thursday. Uh, I believe it was called TD LLC. And uh, it was a win for the taxpayer, which uh, is it's somewhat ironic given that on a going forward basis, the treaty seeks to deal with this issue. But uh, the, the court did conclude that it was inconsistent and unreasonable for the Canadian authorities to take the position uh, in that case, that an LLC carrying on business in Canada was not uh, entitled to the reduced rate of uh, branch tax that is uh, available to U.S. residents. So it remains to be seen, I think, how that decision, whether it will be appealed, and how that decision will mesh with the new provisions of the treaty. The advertised solution to this issue uh, when the treaty was released, or when the protocol amending the treaty was released, was that treaty benefits would be extended to LLCs. That's not exactly what's happening. The new rule, which is in paragraph 6 of Article 4, provides a look-through of fiscally transparent entities. And it provides, if we look at the very simple example uh, on the slide, that notwithstanding that LLC is the visible taxpayer, at least in Canada, amounts of income or gain that are derived by the LLC will be considered to be derived by a resident, in this case of the United States, to the extent that a resident of the United States uh, is, is taxed on those items of income and is treated under the laws uh, of the United States in, in exactly the same way or has the same treatment, and, and that phrase is subject to some debate, uh, as it would be had it received that item of income or gain directly. So in the, in the example again on the slide, uh, it's not a complete solution because the LLC would only be entitled to uh, treaty benefits to the extent of, in this case, U.S. Code, US Code's membership interest in the LLC, uh, to the extent of Cayman Co. or any other non-qualifying U.S. resident uh, ownership in LLC, uh, items, uh, payments to, to the LLC would be, still be subject to the full 25% statutory withholding tax rate in Canada. Uh, and the LLC also, to that extent, would not be uh, entitled to the benefits available to it if it's carrying on business in Canada. <coughs> Some of the issues that have, have cropped up um, with this rule involve deemed payments. Um, 
most deemed payments under the Canada-U.S. tax treaty, for example, deemed dividends that arise out of a Canadian corporation, are treated in the same manner as the payments, the, the payments to which they're assimilated. So a deemed dividend is treated as if it were a dividend. However, given the specific language uh, in Article 4.6, the Canadian government has recently uh, released a, a technical interpretation to the, uh, providing that it is at least of the opinion that in this example, the LLC would not be entitled to, to benefits of the treaty in respect of certain deemed payments out of the CAMCO because one of the threshold criteria that, that's required to be met is that there is an item of gain or income that is recognized in the U.S. and that's simply not the case uh, for many deemed payments. So that's one of the areas where there's still uh, a fair amount of uncertainty and uh, the hope that we all had that the changes in the treaty would simplify and permit the use of LLCs and cross-border business arrangements uh, hasn't, hasn't, quite, uh, hasn't quite borne the fruit that we hoped it would. But uh, we will certainly see how that develops. The second category of new rules that were brought into the treaty uh, are the so-called anti-hybrid rules. The anti-hybrid rules were introduced primarily to address certain aggressive financing, or what the governments at least termed aggressive financing structures, that provided for a double dip, which was a deduction of, of effectively the same interest uh, in, in both jurisdictions. Uh, certainly, I think everyone acknowledges from an international tax policy perspective it, it is not necessarily a bad thing to set up rules that negate the availability of a double dip. Uh, the issue again is the implementation in the treaty of the so-called anti-hybrid rules uh, and the scope uh, to which they extend, which appears to catch many arrangements which were likely not in the minds of the drafters but fall very much square within the words of the treaty. Uh, the anti-hybrid rules have two branches. The first is in Article 47A. Uh, and it applies to an entity in the source state, uh, in, in this example, uh, Canadian LP. Uh, and I should, I should say for the, for the Canadians in the audience, you'll forgive me if I've adopted the, the U.S. form of, uh, of depicting these entities uh, on structure diagrams, but it tends to be easier when, when discussing these hybrid issues. Um, so Article 47A applies if you have a source state entity, in this case Canada LP, that is tra transparent for domestic purposes, which Can LP would be in Canada as a partnership, but not in the, in the resident state, and this is not from the perspective of U.S. Co. being a resident of the U.S. Uh, in this example, Can Can Canadian LP uh, would have checked the box, so to speak, in the U.S. Uh, to be taxed as a corporation under U.S. tax law. What Article 47A says is that to the extent that U.S. code derives amounts of income through Canadian LP that Canada would otherwise treat it as deriving directly and to which it would extend benefits of the treaty, and to the extent that the treatment uh, of those items is different to U.S. code by virtue of it deriving those amounts through Canadian LP, which is opaque for U.S. tax purposes, uh, Canada will not extend treaty benefits to those payments. Uh, there's been, I think, a general level of acknowledgement that this rule is pretty well targeted to these kinds of entities which were used in the financing structures that I think were the motivation behind the anti-hybrid rules. The second branch of the anti-hybrid rules contained in Article 47B was somewhat more unexpected and uh, provides a little bit more difficulty in its application. Article 47B applies to entities that in the source state are opaque, but uh, in the resident state are treated as fiscally transparent. So in this, in, again, in this very simple example, Canadian ULC is an unlimited liability company in Canada. Canada treats that as any other corporation, as a visible taxpayer. Uh, however, my understanding uh, at least, and, and please want somebody from the U.S. correct me if I'm wrong, that ULCs are either by default or uh, subject to the making of a check-the-box election, entitled to be treated either as disregarded entities uh, for U.S. tax purposes 
or as partnerships to the extent that they have multiple uh, shareholders. So what 47B says is to the extent that U.S. Co. in this example derives amounts of income or gain through an entity, Canadian ULC, that is opaque in the source state but transparent in the U.S., and to the extent that the treatment of those items of income or profit is different in the U.S., uh, by virtue of it being treated as fiscally transparent under U.S. tax law, again, treaty benefits will not be available in respect of those items of income or gain. The justification behind this rule, again, is easy to understand because these financing structures took advantage of precisely that different characterization of these entities in each of the two states in order to achieve their benefits. The problem with the way this rule is drafted is that it is extremely broad and applies to all kinds of payments, not just deductible payments, in respect of which I think it's fair to say that there's more scope for mischief and tax planning uh, when it comes to using these entities and tax structures. So the example that's on the slide of Canadian ULC uh, owned by USCO uh, may in fact be a very simple uh, structure that's been employed by many US investors into Canada. The advantage in this case of the Canadian ULC being a disregarded entity, my understanding is that, the, that some of the advantages to the US uh, entity would be uh, easier consolidation for US tax purposes and uh, an easier analysis and better availability of foreign tax credits in, to the extent that Canadian tax is payable on items of income uh, earned by Canadian ULC. The problem is that that is a very simple, non-aggressive structure, and yet it's caught by the words of 47B. Um, we, we've, ha we've heard from the government pretty much that this result was unintended, but they acknowledge that, that that is the result of the words of the treaty, and certainly the technical explanation that was released in the treaty doesn't provide for any relief. What has been done, um, and I guess I should say, uh, to the extent the treaty benefits are, are denied, um, again, items of, of payments across the border would be subject to the full statutory withholding rates in Canada uh, of 25%. There have been certain structural um, solutions suggested in light of this rule and the Canada Revenue Agency has provided a couple of income, advanced income tax rulings on some of these structures. Uh, one of them for dividends, uh, I won't get into the technicalities, I'm certainly happy to discuss them if anyone's interested, involves the triggering of a deemed dividend which unlike my, my example in uh, the LLC a couple of slides back, magically uh, will, will not be a problem under the treaty rules uh, to, to trigger uh, a deemed dividend that would be subject to withholding tax. Because the deemed dividend is treated equally uh, uh, in the U.S., regardless of the disregarded status of the ULC, that is to say the deemed dividend is, is generally disregarded, um, it is entitled to the reduced treaty withholding tax rates and uh, there's a method by which capital can then be returned from the Canadian company free withholding tax to economically achieve the same result of, as a dividend uh, at the lower withholding tax rate. Uh, Canada Revenue Agency, as I've said, has, has provided a couple of income tax, advanced income tax rulings on the structure, uh, but of course uh, they're very careful to reserve their right to attack any particular structure to the extent that they believe that it's being used in an abusive way. Right. Uh, not sort of within the spirit of the provision. More difficult, uh, as I said, is the prospect uh, of deductible payments where there is more scope for, uh, for mischief, or even if not mischief, if we look at the previous slide, if, if we replace that, that payment of dividends with the payment of income, uh, the payment of, of, excuse me, payment of interest from the Canadian US, ULC to USCO, uh, assuming that the Canadian domestic requirements were met, the interest would be deductible uh, to the ULC in computing its income in Canada, but by virtue of the disregarded status of the ULC, that interest would not be recognized as income in the US. And so while it wouldn't be a double dip, you would magically have a, uh, a deduction in Canada with no corresponding recognition of income in the US. And Canada has said that it is uh, it, it's certainly not inclined to rule favorably on any structure 
that has that result because they certainly feel that um, they should have the entitlement to, to tax that where there's no corresponding tax in the U.S. Um, however, there may be certain structural uh, solutions to have an interest payment go to some other entity in a consolidated U.S. group where the item uh, of income would be recognized in the U.S. as a payment between perhaps two different U.S. entities, uh, but still recognized as an item of income in the U.S. And the Canada Revenue Agency has, has indicated that it might be uh, willing to rule favorably uh, in those kinds of circumstances, but again, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I think uh, the, the last category of, of innovation that I wanted to address in the Canada-U.S. tax treaty is the introduction from the Canadian side of reciprocal limitation on benefits rules. The LOB rules uh, have been in place from the U.S. side since the 1995 protocol to the treaty, uh, but this is new to Canada, and it is the only treaty uh, of Canada that contains comprehensive limitation on benefits rules. And the Canadian authorities have also indicated that they are not inclined to change their treaty negotiation status to, to request these kinds of rules in, uh, in their new treaties. Uh, at a very high level, the rules are designed to prevent treaty shopping, so they're designed to, to prevent the structuring of affairs whereby uh, entities are situated in a, in a jurisdiction solely for the purpose of claiming the benefits of a tax treaty uh, in circumstances where at least the governments feel uh, that those benefits are properly available. The rules provide for several different levels uh, of entitlement to benefits. The most general is so-called qualifying persons, uh, which, which have a number of different categories, including public companies, individuals, and certain private entities that are owned by, uh, by, by sort of, uh, a composite of qualifying persons. Uh, there may be also certain other uh, requirements in those circumstances, such as a, a base erosion test to ensure that uh, the majority of deductible expenses aren't being streamed to non-resident uh, non uh, entities. Uh, there are alternative methods of qualifying for a more limited scope of benefits under the treaty. The active conduct of a connected trade or business test um, will permit a resident that is not otherwise a qualifying person to claim benefits uh, on items of gain or income that, are, uh, that arise in connection with an active, the active conduct of a trade or business that is conducted effectively on both sides of the border. Uh, there's also a so-called derivative benefits rule uh, that extends only to dividends, interest, and royalties in circumstances where it can be demonstrated that although the U.S. resident perspective is not a qualifying person. Um, the, the parent behind the U.S. resident would otherwise be uh, entitled to uh, benefits under its own jurisdiction, uh, under, under the treaty of its own jurisdiction with Canada, uh, that which benefits are not uh, worse than the benefits under the U.S. treaty, and so it's therefore reasonable to, to presume that the structuring through the U.S. was not specifically for the purpose of accessing those, uh, those treaty benefits. And finally, um, it is permissible, there, there is availability to make an application to the competent authority where none of the technical rules apply. Uh, a taxpayer can make an application to the competent authority uh, where they can demonstrate that it is appropriate that treaty benefits be extended and where it can be demonstrated that a particular entity was not situated in a jurisdiction specifically for accessing the benefits of the treaty. Uh, the competent authorities will rule as to whether or not uh, treaty benefits should be extended in a particular circumstance. Um, this rule happens to be one of the key areas in which difficulties arise uh, as a result of differences in vocabulary. As I mentioned, the limitation on benefits rules have been in the treaty in substantially the same form they are today since 1995, but because they only applied from the U.S. perspective, they were drafted uh, initially entirely, I would say, from the U.S. perspective. They've been amended slightly, but not substantially, uh, as a result of the application bilaterally now. And the problem we're facing in Canada is that a lot of the words that are used in these, in these rules are words that are known for purposes of U.S. tax law, but are simply, have no meaning, have no special meaning in Canadian tax law. And, and it, it's an example of needing to, to grapple with that kind of different vocabulary. Some, certainly some comfort can be had and some help is provided by the technical explanation uh, that was published by the U.S. as to the interpretation of these rules. 
And the Canadian government has also confirmed that beyond the technical explanation of this particular treaty, uh, we can look to the U.S. model technical explanation, uh, which is a far more substantive document that relates to the model U.S. tax treaty and the meaning of the provisions uh, in the model treaty. Uh, however, we are, we are still struggling. Uh, one example which, which ties into my last topic of the domestic Canadian uh, developments is that, historically anyways, Canada has always sought domestically to tax non-residents on the disposition of, of private company shares, even where those shares are not a real property interest. And that is a, different, a difference in sort of the, the scope of the Canadian tax rules uh, for most countries, and certainly from the rules that are in almost all of our bilateral tax treaties. So, for example, if we look at the um, levels of qualification for benefits under the LOB rules, um, the qualifying persons test can often be difficult to achieve certainty on because of the level of detail that's required in terms of looking uh, through to the top of the chain of ownership at all the owners, at all of the owners in a structure, uh, as well as in circumstances where the base erosion test applies uh, on a year-by-year -year basis at the deductible expenses of the entity. Uh, many, many taxpayers in practice will rely on the active conduct of a trade business test uh, in order to, to uh, get comfortable that they're entitled to treaty benefits. However, the way the rule is drafted, it's not entirely clear, uh, it certainly wasn't clear when the rule was first drafted to us in Canada, that the gain on the disposition of shares of a Canadian company would be adequately connected to the conduct of an active business uh, in order to qualify under this rule. Certainly in Canada, we've, we've typically viewed the disposition of a business and the capital gain on shares to be distinct from income uh, and, and distinct from, from the income of that business. Uh, and so there was certainly a lot of discomfort when that rule first came out. The Canada Revenue Agency has since released some, uh, some guidance, some much appreciated guidance on this topic, uh, effectively to the extent that where the gain can be attributed to the value of that connected business, the Canada Revenue Agency will, uh, will apply the active conduct of the trader business uh, test to, to bring the treaty benefits in respect of that. But um, th that is just one example, and, and there are others. Where, uh, where the language that was developed initially in the U.S. context um, provides just a little bit of difficulty for us in Canada in terms of its application. Uh, the very final topic that I just wanted to cover briefly are uh, some of the changes announced in the recent Canadian budget. Uh, the first and probably the most significant, uh, as I alluded to, historically Canada has domestically sought to tax non-residents on the disposition of so-called taxable Canadian property, which included shares of private Canadian companies, among other things, even if they were not uh, interests in Canadian real property. As I said, that's different from most countries, and that's different from the majority of our income tax treaties, which provide uh, exemption uh, from tax on gains, except to the extent that the gain is derived from real property. However, there are domestic compliance obligations, so-called Section 116 compliance obligations in the obtaining of compliance certificates, which are quite onerous, which still apply in these circumstances, and provided somewhat of a disincentive to foreign investment in Canada, and certainly a nuisance uh, to, to many a taxpayer. Um, very quickly, the, the, the compliance regime required the obtaining of a compliance certificate in any circumstance where a non-resident was disposing of taxable Canadian property. If the certificate was not provided to the purchaser, the purchaser would typically withhold 25% of the purchase price and remit it to the government uh, unless a certificate was provided. And in recent years, the obtaining of the certificate uh, could take as long as six months to a year, depending on the circumstances. And uh, it also required uh, the, the provision to the Canadian tax authorities uh, of a lot of detailed information that is some sometimes uh, frequently difficult to obtain. And during that six months to a year, vendors would have 25% of their proceeds tied up in escrow. So this circumstance certainly provided uh, a disincentive, as I say, to, to some investment that was, was a nuisance. Um, thankfully, the budget announced uh, March 4 in Canada has proposed a change to the definition of taxable Canadian property. Uh, under the new definition, um, taxable Canadian property will only consist of Canadian real property, property used in the Canadian business, certain uh, insurance and, and financial property, and 
shares or shares of a corporation or interests in trusts and partnerships that are real property interests, which is to say they derive more than 50% of their value from real property situated in Canada. That test, um, not to make our lives too simple, is still applied on a 60-month look-back basis. So shares will be so-called taxable Canadian property if they derive their value more than 50% from Canadian real property at any time within the last five years. So there's still, uh, there's still some investigation to be done. And the rules as currently drafted don't explicitly provide for a due diligence defense. So uh, the, the extent to which uh, reliance will be placed on these rules in practice remains to be seen. But certainly uh, the, the intent behind the rules has been made clear by the government. And uh, it's a very positive development in terms of uh, investment in Canada. And uh, I guess the final, the final change that I, that I would just touch on uh, extremely briefly uh, Canada has had for some time uh, two regimes of anti-avoidance rules uh, that have been proposed for a number of years uh, and proposed to be retroactive uh, in their application back to the date of original announcement. The so-called non-resident trust and foreign investment entity rules. The budget uh, announced at the beginning of March uh, uh, announced that the FIE rules, the FIE proposals are being withdrawn and the, the, the existing rules in the Income Tax Act uh, will, be, will be applied in their stead with some minor revisions. And the non-resident trust rules are being amended to provide greater certainty and clearer exemptions for commercial trusts, which, uh, which was one of the key areas of difficulty with the, with the previous rules uh, and their very broad scope of application. So uh, I think I will leave it at that. Thank you again for the opportunity of speaking, and uh, I will certainly welcome any questions that anybody has. We have time for just one or two questions before the break. Yes. Uh, David Fung uh, from Vancouver. What is the status with respect to any recent changes uh, with respect to the permanent establishment uh, situation? And how are the sales taxes being imposed by states being treated in the U.S.-Canada treaty? I can uh, start from the, from, from the Canadian perspective. Um, there, there were a couple of changes announced uh, to the permanent establishment uh, article in the Canada U.S. Tax Treaty in the context of the recent protocol. Uh, the most, um, the biggest of those changes was the so-called service permanent establishment rule, which provides that an entity which doesn't otherwise, uh, under the typical rules, have a permanent establishment in a state might be deemed to have a permanent establishment if it provides services in that state to a particular customer in the context of the same or a connected series of projects. Um, that is a very atypical provision in most treaties. Uh, certainly I know the U.S. was highly resistant to that change. Uh, that change was lobbied for and pushed for by Canada in response uh, to primarily the Dudney uh, decision in Canada which, which, which was decided in favor of the taxpayer and, and which held that um, a taxpayer in Canada in that case that was providing services for an extended period of time did not have a permanent establishment. Uh, they were using uh, space available at their customers and the court decided that that space was not sufficiently at their disposition to constitute a place of business of, of that non-resident taxpayer. Um, there have also, I just know, been two cases, I think it was decided last year, in Canada, uh, dealing primarily with agency permanent establishments, uh, the Knights of Columbus, and of course the name of the other case escapes me now. Uh, those two cases were also decided in favor of the taxpayer. So <coughs> those are recent developments in the, uh, I would say, domestic Canadian context. Um, I don't know if, if Miller, you have anything else to add on the PD issues? No, I mean, other than when you do have a branch um, and you do have a permanent establishment, the transfer pricing rules do come in. In terms of what the pricing should be, I didn't know if your question was about sales tax in like states in the United States. I think that is may not even really be determined by the income tax treaty. It seems that it would be a function of uh, state law and whether the sales tax would apply there. 
I, I, I certainly think that's correct. I'll caveat that with the fact that I, that I practice only income tax, so I'm not overly conversant uh, with, with the sales tax regime, especially in the U.S., but that would be my understanding. Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Michael Robinson, questions for Jeffrey, one facetious and one real. Uh, I see from your uh, CV that uh, with a degree with Dean's List in Mechanical Engineering from Waterloo, you should be working for David Funk, <laughs> not doing tax law, <laughs> wasting your time there doing all that technical stuff as a lawyer. Sometimes uh, I do think I should be doing something productive. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other question is, um, back in the bad old days, the, one of the big double-dipping gambits was in the based on the different treatment of lease payments, uh, whether they were disguised conditional sales or not. Is there uh, any scope for that left between Canada and the U.S.? I, I think there still is between Canada and certain European countries, but is that double dip been eliminated? Um, I, I will confess that I that I have heard of, but I'm not overly familiar with, uh, with those leasing structures. I know within the last it's not quite so recent, maybe within the last three years, uh, the Canada Revenue Agency announced a change in its policy on so-called financing leases, uh, whereas before they had sort of more hard and fast rules. Right. I, I think now they, they take the position, which is sort of in accord with, with what they do in, in, in any other context, is you know, they will look to the nature of the transaction and look at the underlying commercial sort of legal status of the documents, and if you know if the incidents of ownership are actually primarily transferred by virtue of the arrangement, they will regard the arrangement as a sale. Um, but if if they if they don't view the arrangement as tantamount to a sale, uh, they they will continue to, to treat it as lease payments. Um, one thing I would I would say is that since the introduction of, of the protocol amending the tax treaty, there certainly has been in the Canada U.S context, an increasing focus on double dip structures that employ not hybrid entities which are covered by the rules in the new treaty provisions, but hybrid instruments. Um, one of the favorites being hybrid debt, which uh, is treated as debt in Canada, but uh, by virtue of certain peripheral arrangements, uh, treated as equity for U.S. purposes. So I, I would imagine uh, by analogy, at least, yeah. that, that those opportunities would still exist uh, in the leasing world to the extent that one would be able to establish sort of different treatments in the two countries. I, I remember doing a deal a long time ago where the, where the uh, arbitrage available produced an interest rate between Canada and the U.S. of LIBOR minus 6%. So it certainly is an opportunity worth exploring. <laughs> That's right. Any other questions? I, I have one last question for Miller. Um, <clears throat> does the uh, if a company goes in for an advanced pricing agreement, does that increase their risk of audit in the prior years or the future? Uh, it, it's not supposed to uh, increase their <coughs> risk. Uh, however, you know, in, in the case they are actually going in you know, to both tax authorities and asking for a ruling, they could go back and maybe look at preceding years. Uh, now, if the facts and circumstances, though, were the same, then you would be trying to roll that back anyway. So, it, it, it probably, you know, we really haven't seen that as too much of a problem. Very good. Well, well I guess we have a break. And, Dan, uh, what's your plan after the break? We will start at uh, 1045. Very good.